Ready to Blend presents online and blended learning fundamentals, learning from the pioneers. Hi, I'm Heather Clayton Staker, founder and president of Ready to Blend, welcoming you to online and blended learning fundamentals, learning from the pioneers. Many of you have been involved with online teaching for years now. For some of you, the pandemic has caused you to work even harder and to be more invested in online learning. For others of you, this has been a new experience. You've been new to online and blended learning and you wanna learn more. Either way, I welcome you along this journey today. This small course will give you an overview of online and blended learning. And really what I wanna do with you is look to the past and think about where we've been together collectively as a K-12 community in our narrative about what online and blended learning are and how they've evolved, and then use that history to think about what we've just been through. It's been a very transitional, un unusual time in education. And so let's think about our past and our present and then use that to anticipate and design for the future. Many of you, many of us have experienced loss during this time. My hope for you is that together something will be found, that in addition to the loss, we will find something from the journey that we've been on through the pandemic with online and blended learning, and that together we'll discover some of those findings during this class. Our learning objectives, there's really five things I want you to feel you've accomplished from your time spent, well spent in this class with me. The first is to understand online and blended learning and which of their characteristics as disruptive innovations are worth considering as you design your own strategy for your school or classroom. The second is I want you to cultivate a personal openness to trying new strategies with your teaching and learning, trying new things. The third is I want you to be able to envision the core building blocks of a flexible learning arc as a cadence, a way to give a better rhythm to your student experience. Fourth, I want you to be able to analyze options for creating independent work that your students can tackle on their own to make progress on their own. And then fifth, I'm gonna help you free up your time to prioritize individual feedback and coaching for each of your students. So join me on this journey. I want to give thanks to the Wisconsin Digital Learning Collaborative, my longtime partners. I have loved so much working with the state of Wisconsin and the WDLC. And I wanna make you aware of the fact that they've invested in some micro courses that I have co-authored with them that help you take baby steps towards improving your online and blended learning. So if you want to learn more, I turn you to the WDLC, to their selection of Foundations for Blended Teaching micro courses, their selection of Improving Instruction in the Online Modality micro courses, which are really in, um, pertain to improving online learning, whether you're doing it full-time as a full-time virtual school or just as one component of a classroom in a blended environment. Either way, those online modality courses are really great for just fine-tuning what you're doing. And then they also have a number of electives to help you learn discrete, specific competencies that you want to master. So thank you to the WDLC for supporting this work for so long. So let's turn to the past. These three gentlemen that I have here on my screen are some of the pioneers that let's look to originally. Many of you have heard this story already, but I think it's fun and interesting to look at history. In fact, I've become kind of a history amateur junkie in the during the pandemic, only because I found it very comforting to look at the past and what other people have been through and the stories of our past to help me gain more perspective on where we are right now. So I'm hoping that by doing that specifically with online and blended learning, it will just elevate and expand our perspective and help us get more of that bird's eye view that we need in order to chart our course going forward. So the gentleman on the left there is the esteemed, renowned Professor Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School. I had the opportunity to meet him when I was a student. I graduated from from Harvard Business School in 2001. And he was a real mentor and role model to me at the time, not only because of his very popular course on, on um, building a successful and sustainable enterprise, but also because uh, I worked with him through his ecclesiastical volunteer work. And he really was a mentor to me. I love not only his academic research, but also what he meant to me as a person and the way that he lived his life and his value system. 
And then the gentleman in the middle is Michael Horn, who I met when we returned. So I had been in Boston for six years on my own as a single person, riding the subway, living in dorms, and then came back with my husband a few years later when he attended Harvard Business School. This time I had three small children and was driving a minivan and was pregnant with a fourth. And I was interested in becoming involved with the university again. And so I met with Michael Horn and talked a bit about what he was doing. He had just graduated from the business school and was staying on for an extra year to work with Clayton Christensen and the gentleman on the right, uh, Curtis Johnson, to co-author a book that would be later become titled Disrupting Class. Maybe you've heard of it. But the idea was that Clay had developed these, this set of theories related to successful innovation in the in the private sector and in the for-profit sector. And he was interested in turning his life's work to starting to solve vexing problems in the social sector. So he partnered with Curtis Johnson and Michael Horn to write a book around how innovation could help solve problems in K-12 education and higher education, some of the things that we were we'd been stuck. And then he also partnered with another student to write about improvements, using innovation to improve the healthcare industry. And that later became the book, Innovator's Prescription. Anyway, so at this time, it was like 2007, I believe, and I met with Michael Horn in a in a small little room in an office space in Lexington, Massachusetts. And he told me about this manuscript for this book that they were writing together and he offered to let me read it and so i borrowed this confidential manuscript and read through it and i was really excited to hear what the renowned clayton christensen and his maverick team believed would be the solution for some of the problems in k-12 education and i am going to be totally honest i was surprised and maybe a little bit disheartened when i went through the manuscript and saw that they were saying that online learning was going to be one of the key enablers of a better system and i just i didn't have a great taste in my mouth for online learning i thought i when i considered online learning i sort of stereotypically thought of like some colleges i'd heard of that were doing vocational education through online learning and they just didn't seem that appealing to me and I just couldn't imagine that this tiny little blip in the field that was like this tiny little portion of people that were doing online learning or computer-based learning or distance learning, that that would become a notable phenomenon that would change the way the world learns. And that was my main takeaway from the manuscript was just this feeling of, of, of mm, almost skepticism. Well, fast forward a few years and I ended up reaching out to Michael Horn again, hoping to work for the InnoSight Institute, which he and Clay had, had co-founded. It later became renamed as the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation. And Michael took a chance on me and, and hired me to work on the in the education practice. And one of the first jobs I was given was to study online learning as an enabler of uh, changes in schools more closely. And so I became more of a scholar in what they meant when they said that online learning is following the pattern of a disruptive innovation. Here's in a nutshell what they meant. So what they meant is that disruptive innovations transform sectors that are complicated, expensive, inaccessible, unaffordable into sectors that are more accessible and affordable and simple. And they follow a telltale pattern. So one of the classic examples is the evolution of computers. In the early days of computing, large corporations and universities were the only privileged few that could have a, a huge, expensive mainframe computer. And they typically were used to process financial reports. The first disruptive innovation was the mini computer. These were simpler and less expensive relative to the mainframe computer. And so smaller corporations and universities now could have their own computer. And many corporations even found that they could have a computer, a mini computer in each department. So now finally the engineers could get their own mini computer and so forth. And so that disruptive uh, strategy allowed the mini computer to just overtake the mainframe computer eventually until it replaced it entirely. And, and we saw mini computers um, in corporations and universities around, around the world. The next big 
disruptive innovation was the personal computer. When these first came about, they were so inferior compared to the way that we thought about mini computers that really they were relegated as like something for hobbyists or children, but they got better and better. Clayton Christensen told a funny story about how he was the consummate um, low end consumer. He was willing to just take whatever was the cheapest thing. And so he, when he was working on his, his, a PhD dissertation, he purchased a really old crummy Dell laptop and he actually had to get special permission from the department at Harvard to use, to purchase, to use his stipend money for a Dell because they were considered so inferior. But then over time that Dell with its low end disruptive strategy became better and better until you look left, look right. Everyone has a laptop and, and, and really the, the spread of laptops and smartphones and tablets has caused um, a wide dissemination and distribution of of computing power across across many developed countries that really wasn't there in the early days of the mini computer and certainly not in the days of the mainframe computer so that's an example of a disruptive innovation and I should clarify, not everyone has a laptop, but they are much more widely distributed than they were. And it's much more possible to get distributing computing power out to uh, people who are not part of a, a multi-million dollar company and they still have access to a computer. So another example, bringing it closer to home for me because I, so Clayton Christensen made me laugh because he was really, he, he passed away last year. And I just think of him so fondly and um, appreciate his work to this day with great respect. But he seemed to have a proclivity for uh, like, industrials and he always told stories about like steel companies and i always i couldn't fully relate but then he told a story about retailing and i thought oh now i'm listening and he talked about how in um several decades ago there were over 300 full service department stores so stores like macy's dillard's sears jc penny neiman marcus nordstrom today there are fewer than 10. why is that well it's because of the arrival of discount retailers so stores like kmart walmart target and they weren't as good originally as those full service department stores you couldn't go in and have the full set of cosmetics and try on every one and meanwhile pick up your lawnmower and your and your washer dryer while you were there but for a busy person who just wanted to run in and grab a three dollar mascara and go kmart was an easier option and so these discount retailers got their foothold simpler more convenient more affordable and more accessible for a lot of folks and until eventually a lot of the full service department stores were in real trouble or even fully displaced. And then we've seen the next disruption with Amazon coming in and putting real pressure on the discount retailers. And so that story and that pattern continues and continues and continues. The main thesis of Clayton Christensen, Michael Horn, and Curtis Johnson's book, Disrupting Class, is that online learning is following that same pattern of a disruptive innovation. And as such, it's poised to transform the way the world learns. Now, you have to remember, this book came out in 2008. So we are several years beyond when this book first came out, and we have the benefit of hindsight. But let's hear what they were saying at the time. What they said at the time is that one indicator that online learning seems to be following that disruptive trajectory is that disruptive innovations tend to begin in areas of non consumption, or at least that's a very ripe place for a disruptive uh, strategy to be successful. An area of non-consumption is an area where the alternative is nothing at all. If you don't have that disruptive technology, you might not have anything at all to solve your problem. So what they identified was that there were areas of non-consumption in K-12 education where online learning was creeping in to fill that gap to fill what otherwise would just be a complete hole. For example, credit recovery. Many students, if they missed some credits, if they failed some credits, they just had to repeat the course entirely. They couldn't recover. And so schools were starting to use online learning to say, look, maybe they're just scanned PDFs, but it's better than nothing and it'll help you recover those credits. Dropout recovery. AP courses, so a school that didn't offer certain AP courses, maybe they were small or rural or urban and they didn't offer all of the AP courses, students could take them online. Scheduling conflicts, a student wanted to take an extra course that wouldn't fit in their schedule. Uh, tutoring in developed con developing countries, online courses were starting to emerge. After school programs, uh, 
learning options for incarcerated youth, summer school. These were places where online learning was starting to arise. And in fact, if you think about where you first saw online learning in your school system, most likely it's in one of the places I just named. In the early days, that's really where it got its foothold. They also identified that disruptive innovations tend to follow an S-curve pattern where they creep into the sector in the early days of prototyping and messiness until they eventually get good enough that they take off and more and more people use them until eventually they saturate the market. And by, by linearizing this S-curve, the authors of the book projected that by 2019, 50% of high school classes would be online in some form or fashion. And I remember as a speaker for the Christensen Institute, as we got closer and closer to 2019, I started getting nervous because I thought, what if we don't hit that mark? And yet, even pre-pandemic, we were tracking towards it. As you saw more and more schools using Moodle or Canvas to at least do some of the high school experience online. We saw more and more of that progression, but I have to laugh now because it must be very vindicating for the authors that we've more than blown that projection out of the water as um, remote learning and school closure in the past year or two have more than allowed these authors to smile as they've hit that target. The other ind indicator of a disruptive innovation is they tend to improve over time. And this slide really resonated with a lot of people when I said disruptive innovations tend to get better. Think about Target and Walmart and Amazon and Netflix and other disruptive strategies that, that have served your needs now, but they didn't originally, like in the days of Netflix when there was such scant selection and you paid $8 a month and got not very much for it, you got some DVDs in the mail, and now there's this full robust streaming service. Well, disruptive innovations tend to improve over time. And I think the reason the educators were glad for that message was that in the early days of online learning, it really wasn't that savory of a proposition. Very often the courses were made up of scanned PDFs and scanned worksheets and messy, not very user-friendly learning management systems. And oftentimes my message was just hold on because disruptive innovations tend to improve over time and this ecosystem will grow. And you look at it today and it has, there are much more robust online software and app options for students. Uh, Google Chromebooks alone have done so much in, in terms of providing an affordable computing option for, for device access for students. And then another, another way that, that online learning has improved over time is it started to blend into brick and mortar schools. And so this is where I started to enter the story. When I came aboard the Christensen Institute, I started studying this phenomenon that schools were calling blended learning. And Michael said to me, look, why don't you just look out across the world and try to find examples of blended learning, of what teachers were calling blended learning, and see if by looking at those examples, we can deduce what they mean and study that phenomenon to try to come up upon a definition. And so in doing that, I looked at dozens and dozens and dozens of schools and talked to them. And some of the schools we identified as not being blended learning. It seemed like they were just using computers more for like note taking or just post the syllabus or the homework assignment, but it wasn't really where the students were doing some online learning. And what we identified though, was that there were about 40 schools really around the world was what we were able to find. Maybe the, I'm sure there were many more, but it took a lot of work to find 40. Isn't, can you imagine that? Because now everyone can name schools that are doing online learning as part of their brick and mortar experience. But from those 40, we identified three things that seemed to typify them and that these became the hallmarks of the definition. The first is that they all were doing online learning with student control over time, place, path, or pace. So the students actually, there was actually an intentional shift away from teacher-led direct instruction to student-driven online learning. And that gave students some control over their pace, over their path, over their location. The second element was that it was it was involved some kind of a supervised brick and mortar experience away from home. So students were still coming to school, 
And then the third is that the modalities were connected to create an integrated learning experience. So there was data that helped connect. So if, if Sammy was doing some of his long division work online, then the teacher could ostensibly look at that data and use it to help Sammy be in the right group for the face-to-face. -face. And so that, that part of it wasn't always realized, but when teachers talked about blended learning, they tended to be referring to that part of the definition. And so that was what we proposed as the definition and then we said there are some models of blended learning that seem to typify the space these were collectively exhaustive meaning that they seem to collectively describe all of the phenomena we are seeing in the field but they weren't mutually exclusive so in other words schools were oftentimes combining models but in essence, we identified four models. Again, this is a repeat for many of you, but I hope that this history will sharpen your perspective for where we are now. So the models that we identified first were rotation models, where students were rotating between online and face-to-face -face instruction. And we said sometimes that was a station rotation where they were rotating within their classroom. Sometimes it was a lab rotation where they were rotating between a computer lab and their classroom. Sometimes it was a flipped classroom where they were rotating between home where they would do the online lesson, watch the video most often, and then, and then coming to school to do the assignment or the problem set with their teacher or apply the learning or an individual rotation where it was more an individualized rotation for each student. Those were the rotation models. Second, we said some schools have more of a flexible, less rigid model in place, and we called it the flex model. And a flex model was anytime students were, were really using online learning as the backbone of their instruction. And then the face-to-face -face teacher was there, but their role had changed to supporting the students in other ways. The classic example at the time were credit recovery labs, where students could go and they would use the online course to recover the credit, but there were face-to-face -face teachers there that could help them and work through it with them. And then today we see many flex models that have a, a more developed system with project-based learning and um, online learning combined with group discussion. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The third model was the a la carte model where students were doing a fully online course while continuing to attend a brick and mortar school. So they might have been doing online Chinese course because that wasn't available in their school. And so they would do that with an online teacher and then do the rest of their school in a more traditional way. And then the fourth was the enriched virtual model. At the time that I was doing this research, I was living in Hawaii. My husband was working for, for Hawaiian Airlines and we were living in, in Manoa Valley in the on the island of Oahu. And there were some students on the North Shore who were professional surfers, and they were traveling to New Zealand and Australia and all over the place to surf. And so they would do some of their learning online and then just come to school when they were in town. There were other students who lived on other islands. So they would fly in for Maui or Big Island to meet with their face-to-face -face teacher, maybe only once a quarter, and then do the rest of their learning online. Those were examples of enriched virtuals. We also saw a lot of virtual schools that were full-time virtual schools that found that some of their students just weren't not thriving in a fully remote environment. And so they created learning centers or learning labs or some sort of an occasion to meet face to face with those students. And so that was another example of an enriched virtual model. So those were the models we saw. And then we also, of course, also saw a lot of examples of fully virtual schools that were sort of separate from blended, but similar in the sense that they were relying on online learning as part of this or all of the student experience. At the time, it was critical that we pointed out to teachers that blended learning was not the same thing as technology-rich instruction. So many teachers were feeling like if they gave their students an iPad and they gave, and they used a smart board from the front of the room, that they were doing blended learning. But what we found was that there really wasn't that intentional shift towards allowing students to control their own learning. They were more using their device as a glorified notepad. And so we helped teachers identify that if they wanted to truly shift towards embracing what could be gained from online learning, they needed to release some control to students and allow students to move at their own pace and have more pathways and, and those elements that were part of the online experience and not just a traditional classroom that was tech enabled. That was a really salient point at the time. Now, skipping forward to the pandemic, most teachers have not had this issue anymore because most teachers have had to create to empower their students to learn at least from their own location and so at least there was that element of student control over where they were learning from and in that sense they weren't technology rich the amount of control students have had to govern 
like their pace and their pathway has varied. Some schools have given students a lot of agency and some teachers have really retained that have been doing streaming synchronous lessons for much of the remote learning during the pandemic. And in that sense, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't have all of the components that we typically see in vir fully virtual schools that are really premised on online learning and not technology rich instruction. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So I, at the time that I wrote the book Blended, there were more and more requests for speaking. Actually, I would say that really this story took place before the book Blended came out. That By the time that book came out, I had already my heart was won over. But before it came out, as I was just an early in the early days of doing the research, I was getting requests to tell schools about it and to meet for professional development with teachers. And I coughed up $500 for one hour of meeting with this guru in public speaking. I felt like I was not a good public speaker and I wanted her advice. And I felt like, I loved Clayton Christensen, but his voice and his mannerisms were not those that I could easily replicate. I felt like I needed to find my own, my own way of expressing this. And I met with this coach at Great Sacrifice, and it was some of the best money I have ever spent because I confessed to her that I didn't really know if I believed in online learning still, that I had seen too many schools where I saw them say it's blended learning time. And that meant the students got out their devices and the teacher kind of disappeared to grade homework or do whatever at her desk. And the teachers seemed to be replaced by the computers that seemed like a loss. Uh, there were too many times where the, the, online curriculum was not engaging and that the experience overall was not cohesive or engaging or inspiring. And, and I just wasn't sure what my message would be as I stood to speak other than to just express the, um, the results of the academic research. It wasn't until my husband and I visited a school in Austin, Texas, as part of my research that that changed. We visited Austin and toured the Acton Academy. And actually what we did was we sat on the edge of one of their Socratic circles as they were having a morning discussion. And then these first, second, and third, fourth grade students stood up, donned their lab coats, and dispersed across this classroom to work on their individual and group projects and to do their online learning. And it was sensational. I left and I said to my husband, if we don't literally move from Hawaii to Austin, Texas to enroll our children at Acton Academy, then I want to start my own. Because I had both, I had really studied so many blended schools at that point and, and virtual schools. And this was the first time that I saw a student experience that I felt like was superior to the wonderful traditional classrooms that I had attended as a child. I saw these students owning their own journeys, using some of their school day to apply for patents. At the end of our day there, they came together to learn how to build hula hoops and they were ahead academically. So they had used their online learning to really become proficient with this, the things that they needed to learn. And then they were able to apply their learning in projects and then also just have these really rich artistic and group experiences as other parts of their student experience. It was just so lovely to me and so meaningful. And I could see how that agency, the student ability to, to drive their own learning was, was advantageous to these children. And I wanted it for my own children. So that was really a turning point for me. And I would say that if I were to rewrite the book Blended, I would amplify that message that blended learning shifts agency to students. We talk a lot about equity. We talk about inclusivity. Agency is such a big part of that, shifting the power dynamic so that students are not ever in a situation where they might be yelled at or talked down to, but instead they're considered powerful agents of their own learning journey with guides that help them and mentor them and cheer them along. We're emerging at a world where that's more possible. And that is why I believe in these principles that I'm teaching you today in a way that's much more personal than when I first embarked in studying them. I need to tell you one more part of the theory just so that we have a cohesive picture here of where we are as a society. And that's an answer to the question, is blended learning disruptive? Many times people look at those models of blended learning and they say, well, are those all poised to disrupt the status quo? I'm not sure that station rotation is really that 
different from the traditional classroom such that I would call it disruptive. And after looking at this theory and using it in our book, Michael Horn and I would agree with you. So just a quick primer on the theory or a repeat if, you, if you've heard me tell this before. Industries experience a hybrid stage. When those who are in an industry see a disruptive technology emerge, they don't entirely ignore it, but they don't immediately adopt it full-fledged. They kind of combine it with what they've had to create the best of both worlds. The story example we use in the book is the example of the hybrid sailing ship and steam engine. In the early days when the steam engine was developed, it wasn't immediately possible to swap out sails on tall ships for steam engines. For one thing, steam engines weren't very good yet and they required a ton of coal. You would have had to tow along a couple other boats alongside that big tall ship in order to have enough coal to get across the Atlantic Ocean. And for another thing, they were highly combustible and so you were prone to fires. But the tall ship manufacturers saw that steam engine and didn't want to ignore it. They wanted to offer the newest and greatest to their customers. And so they brought it on board their tall ships. And they said, we have the best of both worlds. We have these tall sails, plus we have the steam engine. And in truth, they hardly relied on that steam engine. They mostly still used their sails to get across the Atlantic. The SS Savannah that you see in this painting right here, you can see the steam billowing out from the back as they tried to use that steam engine along with the sails. It eventually ran aground and really the story of the hybrid steam engine tall ship with sails is that it went by the wayside because the steam engine got good enough but it didn't get good enough to completely re replace sails as a result of traveling across the atlantic it got good enough to replace sails because it got its start on lakes and rivers where it was okay that they needed a lot of coal. They could stop frequently and replenish. They were right there along the Mississippi River. They could stop at any dock and put some more coal aboard. And really it was such a boon because it was hard to tack back and forth up and down a river. And sometimes there was no wind and they'd be stuck in the doldrums and they couldn't move. And so having a steam engine was just this great advantage because they could get up and down the river or the lake so much more successfully. So the steam engine got its start there and got good enough and finally was able to port over and power a ship all the way across the Atlantic. We see a similar story with cars. In the early days of the, of the hybrid uh, electric and, and gasoline powered vehicle, it really wasn't good enough to allow the average consumer to be happy purchasing one of those hybrids and get up and down the I-35 in Texas at the speed that they wanted to without having to recharge very frequently. And so the existing car manufacturers developed a, a hybrid. Namely, Toyota came out with the Prius, which is America's hottest selling hybrid, and it had the best of both worlds. It had the, the electrical battery operated, the, the electrical battery, which allowed it to be more, to sell itself as environmentally responsible, but then it also had the gasoline so that if you didn't have a way to recharge or you wanted to go extremely fast to accelerate, you could just rely on that gasoline power to, to turbocharge forward. So then is there any hope for the pure battery operated vehicle to become mainstay across America? And there is, but I don't think it will get become that way as a result of competing against the electric, the gasoline powered cars right away. It needs to incubate. And where is it incubating? It's incubating in golf carts. We're seeing golf carts arise more and more in senior residential communities where the seniors are happy to have a way to get across, get up and down their neighborhoods. And they're okay with the fact that it doesn't accelerate very quickly or it has to be recharged frequently. And also among teenagers, our family was recently at Puerto Aransas in the Gulf of Mexico. And there were so many teenagers darting up and down the beach in these golf carts. And their parents were delighted that these had to be recharged frequently and couldn't travel very far away from the beach house without being recharged and that they couldn't accelerate very quickly. And so if you had to take my bet, these golf carts are going to eventually get better and better until they become good enough that we finally figured out how to have an affordable, simple enough battery operated vehicle that can be good enough for, for me to drive my carpool routes. And that's the story of how hybrids emerge at the same time as pure play disruptive innovations. 
So how do you spot a hybrid? There's four indications of it. One is that it has the old and the new technology, the sales plus the steam engine. The second is that it targets existing users, not non-consumers. So in the case of the SS Savannah, it tried to get those folks that wanted to cross the Atlantic Ocean all the way across the Atlantic, not a new set of consumers like those on the lakes and rivers. The third is that it tries to do the job of the incumbent. Get me all the way across the Atlantic. Get me all the way up and down the I-35 as fast as possible without having to charge very frequently. And then it requires skills in both the old and the new. You have to know how to manage the sail rigging as well as the steamship technology. So why is this important? Well, hybrids do not tend to disrupt the sector. They don't disrupt the sector. They sustain the sector. They make it better, but they don't shift us to a new world that's vastly simpler, more convenient, more accessible, more affordable. And so when we look at blended learning, what we've identified is that there are some hybrid models that don't seem like they've really transformed K-12 education. They've made it better. They maybe have even made it breakthrough better, but they aren't fully changing the, the business model. What models are in the hybrid zone? Well, the station rotation, lab rotation, and flipped classroom all appear to be hybrid models of blended learning. And then meanwhile, individual rotation, flex, a la carte, and enriched virtual all have more of the characteristics of a pure play disruptive innovation. What we told educators at the time was that the best advice we could see was to create a two-part strategy. Use those hybrid models like a station rotation to improve your existing classrooms. And then meanwhile, use those disruptive models to fill a gap in non-consumption. If you don't have the best summer school program out there, figure out how to do a flex model. Figure out how to break the world's best e-learning cafe with an a la carte model. Figure out how to do the best enriched virtual model that families could use so they could do their vacation, spend some time at the pool, and also do their online learning and come to class. Figure out how to do a summer school as best as possible. That's a great way not only to learn how to do a flex model, but also to plug a hole so that students who maybe want to be in algebra by eighth grade can do a summer school program that's actually inspiring and engaging and, and be ready for, for algebra in eighth grade. The other reason to do the disruptive strategy at the same time as, as play around with the hybrids is that we predicted that disruptive models would someday replace the high school experience ent all, entirely and the middle school experience to a large extent as well. Fast forward to the pandemic and that prediction is more than proving true. I don't see existing high schools who have really used a learning management system well this past year ever retreating to a purely analog way of, of instructing students anymore. And so the schools that took our advice and pursued a disruptive strategy, perhaps in tandem with the hybrid models, were so much better prepared for this period of time when they've been shifting to an a situation that has required a more disruptive model. It's required remote learning. It's required to shift away from the traditional classroom as we know it to a model that's much more based on, on agency and, and students having control of their learning and control of their location. And so this, the schools that were pioneering with their disruptive models early on had the advantage. That's not to say that it's too late to catch up. And we're now seeing the advantage of really becoming adept with those more disruptive models of teaching and learning because they offer accommodations and convenience and a simpler way of flexibly meeting student needs, regardless of what hits us, whether there's whenever, the, whatever the next set of circumstances are that require us to adapt flexibly, those disruptive models have the advantage. And that's an important, almost uh, epilogue to the story that you've heard me tell a lot of times is that we suggested that those disruptive models were advantageous to experiment with. And now I think we've really seen that we need to get serious and real and aggressive about using those disruptive models now, figuring out how to do them, finding areas of non-consumption where we can pilot a great credit recovery center, a great summer school, pilot programs to deliver courses that otherwise were out of reach, and use those to 
be skilled enough as a society that we are great at delivering those flexible learning options and remote learning options anytime the case arises. We can do it, we can get better at it, and the pioneers have. So that turns us now to where are we now? You journeyed with me to the past. We did. I did a comprehensive overview of where we've been as a field because we've come a long way since when I first heard about online learning and I skeptically replied that I wasn't sure if it would ever be a thing. Well, it's become a thing. And so what has happened in the past year or two and what does that mean for us going forward? Let me show you this video that I created that is a tribute to the educators who have just survived the past year of pandemic instruction, whatever that looked like for you, whether you did a wonderful job or you just survived. I have, I'm so touched by the heroism and courage that was on display across the world among so many educators who were forced to innovate um, and work outside comfort zones and work under circumstances that were definitely not optimal. And so join me as we watch this video that I hope will um, express some of what I've felt. Meet Gen Z, the COVID generation. Learning from home or in person. Enduring some disappointment loneliness, having new experiences, while some things have felt somewhat the same. Some children have gotten extra attention, thanks to parents, pods, or private tutors. Others have fallen behind. Meet the teachers who have been there for Gen Z. Teaching remotely, teaching in person, and in many cases, doing both at the same time. Courage is being afraid, worn out, uncertain, but going on anyhow. Sometimes courage is a quiet voice. Sometimes, courage is bold leadership. Sometimes, courage is just showing up. To all educators who have shown courage, and who have done what you can with what you have, we honor you and give you thanks. Ready to blend. When COVID came to America, schools began to close on March 3rd, 2020. The U.S. school closures because of coronavirus began in New York private schools on March 3rd. They expanded to some Seattle area public schools on March 6th. And since then, school closures swept the country, as you know. It's been over 392 days. 11 states have a full or partial closure in effect still at the time of this recording. The remaining 41 have a variety of safety protocols in place and hybrid schedules. What we've seen as a result of the pandemic is that schools have relied more and more on fully virtual schools that have just seen their numbers explode in many cases and on disruptive models of blended learning, meaning the models like flex, a la carte, and enriched virtual that, that allow for more student control, more opportunity for students to have flexibility about at least the location from which they're learning. We've seen our headlines such as this, coronavirus is pushing the US childcare industry to the brink of collapse, or surge in child hunger overwhelms richest US countries, counties. These are just examples of the that evidence how more and more students have faced pronounced physiological, emotional, and physical safety needs during these past couple of years. We've talked a lot about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the need to administer to students physiological, emotional, safety, and social belonging needs before thinking too much about pushing them towards academic achievement.
We've also seen that students have fallen behind, but students of color have fared worse. This chart from a recent McKinsey report shows that on average, students in fifth grade math are, students of color are, uh, are 37% of where they have been historically. And students with greater than 50% white are 53% of where they were historically. So um, loss across the board, but worse, uh, worse um, gaps and losses for students of color. I mentioned that this has been a season of loss and that my intent is for us to have found something in, in this as well. So how can we learn from the pioneers in order to find something from, from this time that we've been through? There was a report from Thomas Arnett, a blog from Thomas Arnett, who said that distance learning, let's not reinvent the wheel. And he said that there have been numerous pioneers in online and blended learning who have found real successes through the School of Hard Knocks for the past 20 years as they have, have pioneered new methods of teaching and learning. Granted, many have not been successful, as successful as their traditional counterparts, but they've been trying to do a different job. They've been trying to serve students who needed flexibility these past 20 years, who wanted a home-based setup, who were looking for something different from what traditional schools offer. And by figuring out how to do that, these schools offer us a glimpse of what it would look like to be real pioneers, to follow the example of the pioneers. So I wanna look at three places where we can learn from these pioneers. And there are many more, but these are the three that I wanna focus on with you. The first is their mindsets, their personal openness to trying new strategies as educators. The second thing that, way that we can look to the pioneers is by looking at their learning design. And I've deconstructed it into some building blocks, four specific blocks that make up a learning arc. And then the third is the relationships, the way that they rethink the teacher role so that it really focuses on peer to peer, teacher to student, and then admin to teacher relationships. Let's look at all three of those. First, the personal openness to trying new strategies this year. I'm hoping you'll ask yourself, how can I move into a mindset of courage and creativity? Big change to daily routines feel deeply emotional and difficult for most people. This tweet from Alexander Finley, I think is, you'll remember what it felt like in, in March, and this is in June of 2020. She said, her administrators in 2020 were saying, please be prepared to teach online, in person, both simultaneously, on a moving train, while juggling in a burning building under the sea during a wrestling match with a T-Rex as a hologram and riding a unicorn. Also be safe and we value you. Perhaps you can remember when it felt like that, but as everyone was scrambling to quickly try to get remote instruction put into place, or if you were in a fully virtual school to accommodate more students and more change than you were expecting, why can that feel so stressful? One is that we fear losing something of value. Teachers who were moving to remote feared losing that precious connection face-to-face -face with their students. Teachers who were shifting to a bigger remote uh, workload as fully virtual students, teachers, were fearful of losing the connection that they enjoyed when they had smaller cohorts of students for whom they were responsible. A second is fear of not being able to adapt to the new ways. So many educators and parents worried that they were underprepared for what the world had suddenly required of them. And a third is that humans want to feel, have a need for certainty. They need to know that they'll be, we, we want to know that we'll be safe and secure. And when we're thrown out of whack with that, it can be deeply unsettling. So if you've experienced emotional and difficult times in the past 12 months, I hope that you will have some grace with yourself as it's not surprising. Um, these changes can feel deeply emotional and difficult for most people. One possibility that we can adopt from looking to the pioneers is to choose mindsets intentionally. Research shows that one way to develop successful mindsets is to replace unwanted thoughts with new thoughts that are useful and believable. So as you look back or you look forward to what your life will be like as an educator and or a parent with in a world where there's more, where there's different types of teaching and learning than we had in the past, what are useful and believable thoughts that can help you embrace that with courage and creativity? 
Along with this course, I've posted a graphic organizer to help you take notes. So if you'll look for that link, if you would like to write now and open it up, I'm hoping that you'll brainstorm useful and believable thoughts during this next segment that I'm about to teach you, and then make a personal commitment, a specific personal intention related to practicing a useful and believable thought as you move forward in whatever your new role is in this changed world. So here are some ideas and data points that might help you form a useful and believable thought. The first is this, um, I'm just going to play a little snippet of this lecture from Professor Eric Mazur, who was a, a physics professor who was famous for realizing that his lectures weren't doing much good. And so he flipped them. He was one of the pioneers of the flipped classroom and he had his students watch the lecture ahead of time and then come to class and help each other with the problem sets. And so it was super successful and he went on to be a real pioneer of thinking about using learning science to improve pedagogy. Listen to how he starts this, this keynote though. I think it's really um, wonderful. Oh, it's time to get some interaction going. That's the problem with these learning spaces, or these spaces in general, the audience is put in a passive role. So I hope to actually engage you all, get you doing something. In fact, in my workshop, I'm going to show some data, some absolutely mind-blowing data that were collected at MIT that show that people in an auditorium, including students in the classroom, have less brain activity when they're sitting in an auditorium than when they're sleeping in their bed. <laughs> so, so let's do some thought experiments and get really conceptual here and think about what happens, big picture, to the learning design when we shift from teacher-delivered lessons, whether in person or streaming, the synchronous lessons, to student-driven learning, where students are equipped to access the lessons on their own. What are some things that happen? One is that it frees up your time as a teacher. And we're gonna talk about that more and how it enables one-to-one -one relationship building and mentoring with students. Two is that it is easier for the teacher or for the system to tailor instruction to fill holes. In disrupting class, they call the traditional system monolithic. The idea is that it's one standardized system. And although there's an effort to differentiate, it's really hard for teachers because the system fights against it. The system makes it hard to pause instruction for the rest of the class while you minister to the needs of an individual student. In, in contrast, when the lessons are student driven, then students can master the lessons that they're ready for. Sal Khan says that students in a traditional setup acquire, develop a Swiss cheese problem, which is that they have a gap here and a hole there. And over time, those gaps accrue so that then they are missing major content that keeps them from being successful in the classroom. That problem is alleviated in a system that is more tailored to the individual. Another thing that happens is that it removes constraints that create undesirable rigidities. I met a fifth grade young man named John who had was just struggling with with social and emotional problems as many he was actually in sixth grade uh, as many middle school aged adolescents are and his mother expressed to me that during the past year, because the school has been very flexible around whether students come to school in person or they stay remote, she's been able to adjust based on where John is and what he needs and that he's getting great, good grades, but some days he works from home and that his uh, mental health has actually greatly improved as a result of that flexibility. Is it necessary that our classroom structure is as rigid as it's become? Or could we breathe some flexibility into it to better accommodate the variety of learners and their circumstances? And then finally, shifting to a more learner-driven approach can open opportunities for what I just call joy. 
I was on campus at Acton Academy and the students were just kind of gleefully leaving school that day. And I saw the lead guide saying goodbye to everyone. And I said to him, Matthew, why is there so much joy on this campus? And he said, I just think it's the liberty and that liberty is ennobling for people. And I couldn't help but think he was right that the way that those learners have been equipped with the skills to manage their own learning and then set free to actually do that, held to accountability, um, they, they are, they really, there's really a joy in that culture. And, and it also just opens ways, opportunities for self-actualization, the highest tiers of Maslow's pyramid. As you consider the ways that students can pursue individual goals, individual passions, individual interests based on what's relevant in their lives. So I'd like to invite you again to open your graphic organizer. I've linked to it in the notes with this class and brainstorm thoughts that are useful to you and also believable. They can't be so far fetched that you don't like you don't actually authentically resonate with them. And then if you would write down a personal commitment, a specific personal intention related to practicing a useful and believable thought. Bottom line for this part of the class, I'd like to invite you to choose your mindsets intentionally. Unwanted thoughts like this is all loss or no gain and no gain, or I have no idea how to do this. What replacement thought could you believe? If you're struggling, try beginning with a sentence stem like it's possible that. Um, here are some that I like. I am relentless for the things I care about the most. That's a great thought for me. I am willing to try new things in order to reach and engage each of my students. I can overcome fear and anxiety by taking action. I know there's no truly perfect moment to move forward, so I don't wait. I can see adversity as a means for improvement, not as something that holds me back. I am powerful enough to overcome unexpected challenges. Let's turn now to the second focus area that I mentioned, the learning design. And I want to just brief you on the building blocks of a flexible learning arc. I told you about the flex model. And the reason it's germane right now is that we're shifting as a society away from those more rigid rotation models towards a more flexible model that can accommodate a variety of circumstances, whether students at home or at school or toggling back and forth, whatever their needs are, these more flexible models are really important. And so what we've spent the past 18 months doing is deconstructing what are the pioneers of flex models doing. And while there's a broad variety, there's four main modalities that typify many of these flex models. So on this chart, I want you to, and it says blended learning arc, but these modalities also work in a virtual, fully virtual setting. So let's just call them learning arcs for now. These are modalities that I would argue and the research shows have benefits that extend far beyond purely online learning. And so we wanna think about a student experience that's more comprehensive than just that modality of online learning. So what might be the components, the basic components of that more flexible student experience? Well, imagine with me a rocket taking off and launching into space, pursuing its mission and then landing. And that's what I mean when I say an arc. And the cadence here is, is that arc-like effect. So look at the middle row, the student's perspective. They would launch their day with a group discussion where they connect with other members of the community. Maybe they're equipped with a skill that they need for the day, like how do we uh, persist in the face of setbacks or who's some, what, what does it feel like to be in flow? Those are examples of discussions that would equip students with a skill, or maybe they're just inspired to excellence by holding up an example. And, and I borrow some of these ideas from Jeff and Laura Sander for at, at the Acton Academy, who are just exceptionally gifted with structuring high energy Socratic discussions to connect the group at the beginning of a work sprint. Then the students move into their work sprint, whether it's independent work or collaborative work. When I say independent work, that's where we really see the, the independent online learning predominantly. Collaborative work is where you see the project-based learning, whether that's done through a remote, a Zoom type connection or whether it's done face-to-face. -face. And then the students come back together for a group discussion. That cadence can happen on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, or even in a 
in a block of time within the day. So maybe you'd start the day with a group discussion, you'd launch into a work sprint, and then end with a group discussion, you'd break for recess and you'd do it again. Meanwhile, look at that top row, the teacher's perspective. The teacher helps guide that group discussion. And then the teacher's time is freed up for one-on-one -on -one check ins and which are so powerful. And we'll talk about in a minute. And then it gives the teacher an opportunity to close the segment with another group discussion. So those are some elements to think about as you consider the modalities that seem to arise more again and again in a flexible learning arc environment. Every school has different circumstances. You might also feel like long periods of extended free reading or extra athletics or whatever it is, is really important for your students. And that's critical to, to work into it. But I just wanted to give you some of the essential modalities so that it's easier to conceptualize what these learning arcs can look like. I want to invite you to think about which of the four modalities is most likely not to get the time and attention it deserves if you're not intentionally preparing for it. Group discussion, independent work posted on an online platform, collaborative work, or one-on-one -on -one check-ins. If you'll turn on your graphic organizer to the second page, which is reflecting on learning arcs, think about it and, and make that decision. And then think about how could you arrange your weekly schedule to allow appropriate time for each of these four modalities. Potentially, this could be a resource that you use in a PLC to, to talk to your colleagues about these, these questions. Let's move on now to another element of the learning design, which is the independent work. If we recall in that learning arc, there is a critical point where the teacher moves to one-on-one -on -one check ins and the students are, are invited to work on their individual goals and to make progress. How do we structure that independent work, online work successfully? I want to give you three options. The first, and these names come from Miami Dade in Florida, they have worked for a long time on thinking about hybrid models and blended models because they have um, faced hurricanes. And so they've always, they've been thinking about it. So they were one of the leaders during the pandemic for being really well prepared. So let's look to them as pioneers. One of the models is the teacher directed instructional model where the teacher defines the learning objectives for the week, chooses digital content and assigns objective tests and performance tasks. So the teacher's really curating and creating the online work. A second model is the software directed instructional model, and that's where teachers guide their students as they progress through third party online learning software, e courses, apps, and so forth. And then, third is a hybrid model. I, I hate to use that word again, but it's a combination of those two above. So, let's look in more detail what those look like. How would you build a teacher directed instructional model? We've seen these all over the place this past year. So, what the teachers are doing is they're identifying the learning objectives. They want the students to be able to say, I can do this, this, and this by the end of this, this lesson or unit. And then they're posting the content to a platform. The teachers with perhaps less sophistication, uh, but still that want to be digital are sometimes just putting the content on a Google slide and saying, here's the assignment for the week. We saw this at the beginning of the pandemic as, as teachers that had been offline were scrambling to put some content online. Teachers with more training can move to more of a Google Classroom environment. And then the, um, the other option is to use a full learning management system. And so these are different options for thinking about for how you want to post that content so that students can access it on their own. And then the third step is to create the the assignments and quizzes and whatever it is for students to demonstrate what they've learned. So that's the basic structure of the teacher directed model. Let's look now at the software directed instructional model. In this case, you'd start by selecting third party software. Uh, the benefit to this being that there are millions of dollars poured into many of these apps and courses, and they have functionality that is very hard for an individual teacher to recreate unless you are given millions of dollars of budget and lots of extra time. Also, it allows you to jump more quickly into one-on-one -on -one coaching and relationship building and discussion leading because you're not spending all of your time trying to create content. Some teachers love to create content. And so maybe the teacher directed model is the right one for them. So choose your content from a third party provider and then set minimum pacing standards. So decide, whether so 
identify how far the students need to get in that e-course or on the app, how many points they need to earn or whatever the metric is so that they stay on track and the students can use that metric to just level set whether they're making progress and then help students set goals so that they see what minimum pacing is and they decide for themselves what they want to do uh, relative to those metrics. So please open your graphic organizer and just reflect which method of providing independent work will work best for you and your students. Explain in that um, on the organizer or else discuss with your team if you'd like to. And then the third focus area that is foundational to online and blended learning is the building individual one-on-one -on -one relationships. And to me, this is one of the biggest uh, selling points of shifting from a traditional classroom model to an online or blended model. And that is that it frees up when done well and intentionally, it can free up the teacher's time to coach, to provide individual tutoring that one-on-one -on -one time. This is a picture from the Khan Lab School. It's a school at the base of the Khan Academy facility in Northern California. And you can see one of the guides there meeting one-on-one -on -one with this young student. And Deloitte and Touche says that one-on-one -on -one, radically frequent feedback is the killer app of successful human development. And we know that that's the case in the workforce and it's also the case with students. In a McKinsey report, the same report I referred to earlier that highlighted some of the inequities that have arisen during the pandemic, one of the solutions that McKinsey suggests is intensive individual tutoring. We know from study after study that that's one of the most successful things we can do to help every student get caught up. And yet it's so hard in the traditional system. To me, that is a rallying cry for shifting to a more blended or online system that frees up teachers' time. And then another element of this is leaders helping teachers to envision themselves in this new role so that uh, teachers don't feel like when students are doing their work sprints, it's time for them to grade papers or that they've been replaced, but instead they've been elevated to this higher leverage opportunity to meet individually and accommodate individual circumstances, reteach concepts that an individual has, help an individual set goals or practice a habit or a mindset that would help them unlock their path forward. In a high agency student driven online or blended classroom, relationships are built on trust and consideration, personal and frequent feedback with actionable strategies for improvement are commonplace and a warm connection with the teacher who acts as a consistent mentor is the ideal. Let's watch this video about how might online learning enable you to prioritize individual relationships more now than in the past. Part of being a good coach is building relationships of trust. I was one of those kids that was kind of lost in the weeds. A lot of stuff didn't exactly make sense right off the back, so I felt like I was constantly behind and constantly just not where everybody else was. Then Coach Fernandez came into my life. He sat me down one day and had an honest conversation with me to let me know that I was messing up and let me know that I could do it and let me know that it was possible for me to pass certain classes and graduate and go on to do bigger and better things. With us having that relationship and that trust, I knew that what he was telling me was really there to help me. With that trust, I went to him more. So when there was problems, when there was parts, when I felt like I couldn't do something, I had somebody to go to. If every teacher would have been like that, oh man, what a world that would have been. The most powerful tool that we have are our caring teachers, the individuals that interact with students on a daily basis. It's our number one plan in the school to help students obtain academic success. We can't alleviate every issue and every situation from students, but what we can do is we can provide every student with a caring adult that they can meet with, that they can talk with, that can help them overcome barriers. If they have that adult that's constantly following up with them, setting goals with them, helping them achieve those goals, it's going to help them overcome challenges through the rest of their life and going to help them be successful. So coming up in language arts, you have just as much as when you're in a traditional classroom that you need to have great relationships with your students. It's true for online courses as well. I really work hard at the beginning to get to know the students and what they're interested in 
and let them know about myself as well, that I'm a safe person to talk to. A lot of times when I meet with my students, it's in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, so it really gives them a safe space where they can come and feel like they can talk to me. The 9-11 Museum, that sounds so interesting. Um, we... It's a huge benefit as I do know each of my students as an individual. It helps me to give them feedback that they're ready for. And if I know that today is a really good day, then I know I can take them to the next level and really challenge them. As the principal of an online school, it's no less important and maybe even more important that I work hard to build relationships of trust with my teachers because I need them to be able to do that with students. And so they need to be able to feel comfortable talking to me about the unique challenges of online learning. Some of the ways I build those relationships of trust are by not micromanaging them, but really showing a genuine interest in them as an educator and in their pathway and career. So now, as a coach, being on the other side, connecting with individual students is so important. To see them going from being so frustrated about school, but then after some time and after working that relationship with them, that they're now happy and they're excited and they feel in charge of their own situation and their own life, that they you know, get to take control of what's going on. It's amazing. It's why I wake up every morning. To help you reflect on building one-on-one -on -one coaching relationships, turn in your graphic organizer to the page about one-on-one -on -one coaching and, and think about if you had 10 to 15 minutes to meet one-on-one -on -one with each of your students each week, what would you most like to accomplish during that time? And then there are some options. Genuinely get to, genuinely get to know each student and have an impact on their lives. Give feedback on a work product. Help students select and practice habits of success. Use the time to revisit classroom norms to establish a strong culture. Discuss individual student goals or something else. Which one of those would stand out the most to you? Some people say 15 minutes a week, that's not much. But if you think back on when you were a student, chances are you rarely met one-on-one -on -one with your teachers, maybe once a semester. So once a week would be a big improvement. And now we're seeing some teachers start to speed conference with their students every day, or at least to check in with them in some way, shape, or form every day. It's pretty powerful. So in summary, what have we learned from this class today? I hope that you've learned that online learning has been following the pattern of a disruptive innovation for the past 20 plus years. As online learning has grown, it has expanded beyond distance learning to blended learning. The pandemic increased demand for disruptive models. Focus on three areas to survive and thrive with online and blended learning. Mindsets, your personal mindset, learning design, and relationships. In terms of mindsets, try new thoughts that lead to a mindset of courage and creativity as you innovate. It's possible that you will discover unexpected benefits as you shift to online student-driven learning. Plan for all four modalities of a learning arc, group discussion, independent work posted online, collaborative work, and one-on-one -on -one check-ins. Choose an instructional strategy for creating independent work posted online, whether that's teacher-directed, software-directed, or a combination. And finally, free up your time for one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring, and tutoring. So powerful. If you'd like to keep learning about these concepts, again, the WDLC, Wisconsin Digital Learning microcourses are available for residents of the state of Wisconsin, and they will help you improve your online modality, focus on your blended teaching or an elective of your choice. If you'd like to earn a Bloomboard micro credential that can work towards professional advancement in many states and districts, Bloomboard is offering my Foundations for Blended Learning micro-credentials package. So talk, reach out to me or to Bloomboard to inquire about these micro-credentials. They mirror the concepts that I've been talking about in this course. And then finally, roughly every week, I release a free YouTube class. So you can go to the Ready to Blend YouTube channel and subscribe to that or have a delivery to your inbox by going to readytoblend.com forward slash Tuesdays. And I'll just release a class sort of like this one today that you can use to keep informed with what's happening with online and blended learning and really with student-centered learning and education overall. My passion is in helping adults in the system and in our society innovate in ways that 
lead to greater achievement and well-being for children. And I truly believe that as we innovate, it is possible for us to reach and engage each student. There is no student who cannot learn. Every student can be engaged to learn. And I believe that you can lead the way. Build off of the work of pioneers. Thank you very much for joining me today.